All praise is indeed due to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, blessings and salutations upon Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, complete blessings and salutations upon him and upon all his companions and all those who have followed him and who shall follow him, who are following him. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless every single one of us who is seated here and our families, our offspring, as well as our parents and grandparents and great-grandparents and we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless the previous nations who followed the messengers of the past, the ummah or the nation of Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam, and the nations of all the other anbiya or the prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. May Allah bless them as well and grant them all jannah inshallah. And with us as well, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to take us away in a condition that he will be pleased with us. And we ask him to make the day he takes us away an easy one for us. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us the shahada or the kalima upon our death. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that when we are enshrouded with the kafan and we are placed into our graves, he has mercy on us and he assists us. And definitely he fill our graves with the nur of Iman. Amen. Honored ulama, beloved brothers and sisters, those who are going for Hajj, as well as those who are here, who have been for Hajj, and those who have not been. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept every single act of worship of ours. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make easy for all the hujjaj who are going this year their Hajj. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept it from them and to make their presence for hajj a means of our ease as well. Remember when you make dua for a haji, that Allah grant him ease or her ease, the angels are saying, and Allah grant the one who is making dua even more ease. So it is a dua for ourselves as well. Indeed, yes. The occasion is an occasion of Hajj. We all know we are now very close to Hajj. The Hujjaj are leaving in droves, mashallah. Some are leaving directly from Durban for the first time in history. Subhanallah. I don't know if it's history, but in recent history. Let's word it that way. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make easy as the years pass the Hajj. Many years back, we find that the facilities in Mina and Arafah and in Makkah and Medina al Munawwara were not as grand as they are today. And there are two, three different types of people. Some would tell you that all this facility is not supposed to be there because we are supposed to taste the Hajj the same way that the Prophet wasallam tasted it and fulfilled it. So what is the ease all about? But others will explain to you that if it was not for that ease, a lot of us probably, may Allah protect us all, might come back extremely sick and ill and we might find it extremely difficult. So as a mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He has allowed technology and He has permitted it within limits and it is being made use of. In fact, a few days ago, we were speaking to one of the brothers regarding shaitan and the jamarat. And inshallah, this morning I will speak on some of the spiritual aspects of Hajj, what we are supposed to be achieving from it. And what one of the brothers was telling me is, many decades ago, the Hajj was just a small mark, a small pillar. And people used to, or should I say, when we went to uh, Mina to pelt, it was a small pillar, the shaitan that was there, or the pillar depicting shaitan, who was there at the time of Ibrahim alayhi salatu was salam, was very small. And as the years passed, they made a basin around the pillar. Then they strengthened the pillar. And then they made it bigger and stronger. And they made it now into a ship-like structure. Huge, massive. One wonders whether shaitan within our lives is also becoming stronger and is being strengthened as those pillars are being strengthened. So you find immorality overtaking the globe at large <laughs> as they are putting bricks on that pillar. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us. Obviously that is not from an Islamic aspect but 
It's reality on the ground. You witness it. You see it. As that shaitan is becoming bigger and stronger, and you see him from a greater distance, right now what happens to us is, there are many angles from which shaitan tries to attack us in our lives, whether it is the television or the cassette players, the audio players, the radios, the newspapers, the magazines, the entertainment of all sorts and so on, even the environment and the malls and the stalls. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us all. In the same way we are conscious of the fact that we need to pelt shaitan in hajj we need to be conscious of the fact that he deserves a pelting every day and we need to recognize the pillars that are invisible in our lives that come in front of us on a daily basis may allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us understanding i have chosen today to go through some of the aspects of hajj and what we are meant to be achieving from hajj bearing in mind that some of us may not have yet been and some of us have already been and some of us are going so that having been said, we firstly need to know when does one go for Hajj? When does a person decide now I will go for Hajj or I have to go for Hajj? It's important that we know the answer. The answer is as follows. It's not me or you who decides when I'm going to go or when I should go. It is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who makes the decision for us. We are not allowed to have a say in it. That no, I'm not ready for it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decides whether you are ready or not. If certain conditions are met within you as a sane Muslim who is an adult, then you need to go for the next hajj possible, otherwise you will be sinful. May Allah protect us all. In the process, if it is a female who does not succeed to, to get a mahram with her, then she might be excused momentarily and if it is an individual who fails to secure a place or a visa then also inshallah they will be excused momentarily but for a person whom the conditions are met and they haven't made the effort to go for the next hajj they are sinful if they die between the two hajjs then only allah knows what will happen may allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us all and grant us understanding when you have wealth when you are sane and healthy and you have enough wealth to go and to return and to look after whomsoever you are meant to be looking after whilst you are out, your, whether it's your family members or children or whatever duties you have, and you have the ability and the physical strength and the permission, permission meaning you get a visa, then you have to go for Hajj. It's Allah who made you wealthy. It's Allah who gave you the health. He gave you the means. Whoever manages to go or whoever has the means must stand up and go and this is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Quran <laughs> indeed it is incumbent upon us from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to go for hajj for those who are able to fulfill that journey so the word ability the minute you have the ability whether it is financial and physical and so on all these abilities put together you have the means you must go for the next hajj may allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us all acceptance inshallah if there are from amongst us those who have not yet been wallahi it's our duty i have come across people sometimes who say i'm not yet ready to go you know i'm still young I'm not yet ready to go, you know, I'm not yet married, you know, I'm not yet ready to go because, uh, you know, I'll just wait for a few years. Who knows when I am going to die or you? Who knows what will happen? It is a farad, it is a decision made by Allah. It is like someone telling you that I'm not ready to read salah yet because I'm young. Allahu Akbar. What type of statement is that? It is an unacceptable statement. So that is the first issue that I've addressed when to go for hajj. It's Allah who decides by giving you the means. Once you have the means, the rest of the job is yours. You have to make an effort to now get up, apply, do this, do that. And you have to book and what have you. What type of packages should I book? All that is part of your own decision making, inshallah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us all acceptance. Now, what we need to realize is, in the same way that when we would like to fulfill salah, we need to make wudu in advance. And we need to prepare in advance by going towards the masjid. We need to know how to read salah when we want to fulfill salah. No point in someone saying, right, I'm going to read salah five times a day. They don't even know what to do. 
They don't know where to face. They don't know how to stand. So when we would like to go for Hajj, the first thing we need to do, we need to have purity of intention. I am going for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to fulfill my farad, my duty. This is what I am going for. Thereafter, we need to learn what Hajj is all about in as much detail as we can. You need to know when I arrive, I do this. I will wear my ahram in this way. I will then stand up. I will circumambulate the Kaaba or the Tawaf so many times. This is how I will kiss the stone. This is what will happen. And this is what I need to do after the Tawaf. I need to make two rakats of Salah. And thereafter, I will do this and that. Then on the 8th, I will proceed to Mina. And on the 9th, I will go to Arafah. And on the 9th in the night, I will go to Muzdalifa. And the 10th in the morning, I'll return to Mina and so on. You need to know this. You need to learn it. You need to make sure that you know it on your fingers, fingertips. And that is a duty. So well in advance from Ramadan or before Ramadan or just after Ramadan, we start learning. We need to either attend classes or go to someone who's been or make it your job to learn in one way or another. If we are surfing the internet, we need to be a little bit careful because we need to know what websites we are going on. There are certain non-Muslim websites, totally non-Muslim, that will teach you how to do Hajj in a satanic way. May Allah protect us all. And they, they'll try and tell you that this is right and that is wrong. We, I've seen some of this. And they will give you a whole wrong picture. And yet, when you Google it, you think that you're doing yourself a favor by going onto the net and logging on and trying to check what's happening. No. We need to know what websites we are getting our information from. We need to be very careful because the internet as much as it is a powerful tool for education, it is also the most powerful tool for misinformation and misguidance. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us. It all depends on how we use it. So that is why you need to find out from the ulama, look, I've got this website. Can I check it? Or what do you think of it? And so on. And inshallah, we will then be able to progress. So the message is we need to learn about the hajj, all the actions, what we need to do, as well as, and my advice is normally, we do need to know to a great degree that if I make this mistake, then this is what I will have to do. But my experience is when you learn how to fulfill Hajj, learn how to fulfill it in one way, one way. Generally, we all prefer the Tamattu'. The Hajj of Tamattu' is a Hajj that is preceded with an Umrah. That is the meaning of Tamattu'. You make an Umrah, you come out of Ihram, then you wear your ihram again on the 8th and you go to Mina. So that is known as tamattu', that type of hajj. And what happens, subhanallah, is that a person going for hajj, when they learn all three types of hajj and so on, if they have not sat very carefully and thought about it, what would happen, it would, might confuse them. What should I do? Should I do this now or later? Am I going to slaughter? Am I not going to slaughter? Do I have to wear my haram or not and so on the best thing we can do is learn it one way and don't confuse yourself let's continue inshallah in that particular way without any confusion then too when a mistake happens find out from the ulama there and then ulama close to you whom you know because we don't want to go and ask someone who's following a different madhab to say, look, I've made this mistake. What should happen? He'll tell you, listen, never mind. Just carry on. Subhanallah. And you don't realize that according to us, that is not the case. And there is a hadith to prove everything. According to us, that may not be the case. So therefore, when you make a mistake or you feel that what was in the book, you did not follow it to the T, you need to ask quickly, look, I didn't do this. Now what should I do? Now what should I do? Then inshallah, you will find out. So this point is the point of educating yourself before you go for hajj. It is extremely important. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us all acceptance. Now, let's move to a certain point regarding the reward of hajj. The hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, Whosoever goes for hajj and does not engage in any immorality when they are in hajj, and they do not engage in foul language and unacceptable speech, so these are the conditions. You are not allowed to engage in immorality. You are not allowed to engage in unacceptable behavior. Unacceptable behavior during Hajj. Or foul speech, abusive language, vulgar language, deception from the mouth. Nothing of that nature. Whoever meets these conditions, they will return from Hajj as pure as the day they were born. 
or their mothers gave birth to them. رَجَعَ كَيَوْمِ وَلَدَتْهُ أُمُّهُ According to the hadith, they come back as pure as the day their mothers gave birth to them. What is meant by this purity? Something powerful. When you take a computer and you format the hard drive, what happens? You basically, generally, would get almost a new computer. Because everything is gone, deleted, out. But what do you need to do when it comes to a computer? You need to reinstall your software. You agree? You need to reinstall your software in order to let that computer function in a manner that you probably used it and you had been using it for. So if you have a certain type of software in your computer, before you format it, you need to think that when I format my computer, do I have the disk again to put this program back in? If you don't, you need to make a plan before you actually think of it. Whereas, when it comes to Hajj, when we are forgiven, it is not formatting. It is selective formatting. That is amazing. That's the power of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What is meant by selective formatting? Only that which is bad is deleted. Your beneficial software remains on your computer. Subhanallah. Even when you accept, when a person accepts Islam, a non-Muslim who accepts Islam, they return as pure as the day they were born. That doesn't mean they start with a white slate. No. It means whatever good they've done, by the mercy of Allah, He will carry it through. That's the only time when a person has done a deed for someone besides Allah before, but it was a good deed, and then they accepted Islam. Allah says, إِلَّا مَنْ تَابَ وَآمَنَ وَعَمِلَ عَمَلًا صَالِحًا فَأُولَٰئِكَ يُبَدِّلُ اللَّهُ سَيِّئَاتِهِمْ حَسَنَاتٍ Allah says, those who thereafter make tawbah, and in the case of a non-Muslim, accepts Islam, surrenders to Allah, continues to do good deeds. He says, the bad they did in the past, we convert it into good, even the bad. So if the bad is converted to good, do you think the good is going to be deleted? Never. It can never be deleted. So that is why sometimes you have a non-Muslim who does a lot of good deeds. And thereafter they accept Islam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not waste. Will not waste those bad deeds. Uh, sorry, those good deeds. وَمَا كَانَ اللَّهُ لِيُضِيعَ إِيمَانَكُمْ إِنَّ اللَّهَ بِالنَّاسِ لَرَؤُوفُ الرَّحِيمُ Allah will not waste your belief. That belief in this particular verse is referring to Salah, which was read, facing a different direction from Qibla, and later on the Qibla was changed to Mecca. Those people who read Salah facing that direction, Allah says, we won't waste your Salah. It was facing another angle, another direction altogether, but the Salah was fulfilled. The same applies to me and you, when we are traveling on a journey and you don't have a compass or you are not so sure, and you tried your best, and you faced a certain direction, and you read your salah, afterwards it was made known to you that Qibla was in the other direction altogether. Allah says, we won't waste your salah, and you don't even have to repeat it. It's done and it's finished. So long as you tried, and you made an effort, and you read your salah, according to that effort. So this is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's mercy. When a person returns from hajj, and what is the meaning of return? Returning as soon as you fulfilled all the rituals of hajj, I'm calling them rituals, but that's not the exact appropriate word. But in the English language does not qualify to interpret the word manasik. Manasik has no English equivalent. Manasik are the actions and the acts of worship that are done during Hajj from A to Z. We're just calling them rituals. Now a ritual could be any type of a ritual. I hope we understand what we are saying here. So when a person fulfills the last act, the tawaful wida, and they are walking out, now they're being washed out completely now re-cleansed for the soul for the tenth time possibly because in Arafah you are cleansed in Muzdalifah you are cleansed in Mina you are cleansed you pal shaitan you are cleansed the next shaitan you are cleansed how many times are you bathing how many times do you have the spiritual bath Allahu Akbar we have motor vehicles mashallah beautiful motor vehicles you wash it once you take it to the next garage you wash it again take it to the next then you wax it there then you take it to another one, you buff it there, then you, I don't know what else, you want to respray, paint it and everything, subhanallah. So many times we as human beings are being washed and repainted, alhamdulillah. Now when we are coming back and returning, we are the purest, in the purest condition we ever were. But shaitan is right behind us, right behind us. And this is what we need to always bear in mind. I always tell people, it is very easy to fulfill hajj but it is very difficult to live as a haji.
It is the Hajj, the ritual is very easy, but it's very difficult to live as a Haji and to understand your status and level as a Haji. Some countries in West Africa, if you were to visit them, you will find that anyone who has fulfilled Hajj, no longer are you allowed to call them Mr. or brother or so and so, they are Al-Hajj. Finished. There's no other way. In fact, in the Indo-Pak subcontinent, up to recently, they used to call people Haji Sab and so on. Now, things have changed. One wonders why they've changed. The reality is you need to be reminded every minute that you know you've made Hajj. Like sometimes you have a business person who has shady deals, they go for Hajj, they come back and all the shades are gone. May Allah protect us. Everything is now clear. They remove their glasses, sunglasses and they now see properly. And then they tell you, no, I used to do that, but I made Hajj. I hope that is the case, inshallah, where Hajj has an effect and an impact on us. Because let me tell you, when a person reads Salah, that is the easiest thing to do when it comes to the whole effect of Salah. The easiest part of it is the physical part. Physically, everybody can get up and make wudu. You fight shaitan a little bit and you say Allahu Akbar and you fulfill your Salah. Fajr, Dhuhr, Asr, Maghrib, Isha. What is the most difficult thing to do is to keep that Salah intact, to keep it protected because the minute you backbite about someone, five or ten salah are gone to that person. You now what happened? You physically did it. Spiritually, it did not benefit you. You gave it away by backbiting. Then you cheat someone out of a little bit of money. Then what happens is, suddenly fifteen salah are gone there. It's a payment. And then you, a person might then commit a sin by deceiving someone. Something is gone there. And by the, at the end of the day, they read five salah, they had to pay ten salah. They are overdraft of salah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us. And the same applies to hajj. We fulfill hajj. If we come back and we are still deceiving, cheating, not conscious of how we speak, carrying on as though we've never been there before, then that means we have fulfilled the farad, but we did not achieve the benefit of the hajj. Your farad is done. Which means your duty is physically achieved, but not spiritually. One of the signs of an accepted hajj. You want to know what is an accepted hajj? It's very, very easy to tell when your own hajj is accepted or not. Very easy. A lot of people think it's hard. It's not hard. I will tell you how to tell if your hajj is accepted or if it was just physically accepted. If your life has changed when you came back, your hajj is accepted inshallah. As simple as that. If your life has changed when you came back, it's inshallah, it's accepted in every single way. Allah will grant you Jannah in return. The hadith, the Prophet wasallam says, you return as pure as the day you were born. If you feel that purity and you are now a different man, you started reading your salah five times a day, not involving in gossip and backbiting and slander and rumor spreading and so on, protecting your mouth, your eyes, what you do, what you don't do, your business dealings, being more compassionate, being merciful towards your parents, your children, obedient and so on. The minute everything of that happens, that you have now changed and transformed yourself, you have now been accepted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That hajj is an accepted hajj. So if anyone asks you, or if you would like to know, what is an accepted hajj? You need to say, if you come back a changed person, that hajj is accepted. If you have not changed physically, you have fulfilled a farad. Just like how everybody sometimes fulfills salah. We don't know whose salah is actually being plugged in and who is just doing the action because they just have to fulfill the farad. We ask Allah's protection. So just like salah, when you have the true benefit of salah, you will, your life will change. Every time you read salah, you are plugged in with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And when you switch off the plug, really, when you come out of salah in assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah, you still feel the heat of the heater or the cold of the air condition for a moment. You know, when you turn an air condition off, think of salah as an air condition in a hot day or on a hot day. And you have a cold air con in the room and you switch it on for 15 minutes, for 10 minutes. And now you are cool. You switch it off. It doesn't mean the room is going to get hot. No. But now you open the windows, open the doors, you're a fool. May Allah protect us. You need to preserve the cold until a little bit later, you switch it on again. Switch it on five times a day. I think you'll have cool temperature in your room forever and ever. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us coolness in the grave. So we need to realize the reward of hajj. The reward of hajj. 
it is a place where the most sacred and holiest of people were. Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam. Before him, Adam alayhi salatu wasalam. And after him, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasalam. The best of creation. Imagine, you know, a few days ago in my motor vehicle, I was listening to a nasheed, an Arabic nasheed. And it is an Arabic nasheed praising the holy lands. And in it, it says, Jibreel qad wati athara fi hayyina in kunta fi raybin fadaka hirau. Jibreel qad wati athara fi hayyina in kunta fi raybin fadaka hirau. Min ha huna marra al buraku sahabatan wa ala dura yetanafasul israu. Subhanallah. It says, Jibreel alayhi salatu was salam, referring to Makkah al Mukarrama. Jibreel alayhi salatu was salam has tread this earth, the soil of ours. If you, are, if you are in doubt, there is Hira. He was here. Allahu Akbar. When we visit the Mount of Hira, our hairs should stand. Because not only were the prophets there, the most powerful of all angels, Jibreel alayhi salatu was salam, was there. The hadith says, Lahu situ mi'ati janah. He has 600 wings. Each wing is from the east to the west. That's the, the proper size of Jibreel. Alayhi salatu was salam. Imagine the size of Jibreel is bigger than the earth, is bigger than the whole globe. Because 600 wings, each wing is from the east to the west, complete. That's a hadith, sahih, correct narration of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And yet he came in the form of a man on several occasions. He came in a different form on many occasions. And he was at Hira. Now when we visit Hira, mashallah, we got our camera with us, we click, click the snaps and everything. We say, hey, mashallah, uh, some of us might make a short dua. But do we realize the value of the place we are standing? Wallahi, the most blessed of land is the land of Makkah al-Mukarramah. Shaitan makes us forget that. Normally, I've heard some of the elders saying that Shaitan is more powerful in Makkah than anywhere else because he definitely wants you to, to be led astray. So in Makkah, to lower your gaze is harder than in Durban. I don't know how true that is. I don't know how true that is, but that's what some people say. In Makkah, to avoid the shops is more difficult than in Durban. In Makkah, to, to avoid this and that, to forget what you are there for, is, is easier than everywhere else. You know, they have a canter fair in China twice a year, if I'm not mistaken. And so many business people go, not for a moment do they forget what they are there for. And the, the fair is so big that they say, even if you're there for a whole month, you're not going to cover the fair. It's the size of a city. And they have it twice a year. I'm talking about China. So you find business people going, they meet this man, that man taking credit cards, meaning taking business cards, sorry, and taking this and that and making a deal here and striking this and that and looking at this and what have you. And the day ends and they go to sleep, fall early morning, they back up and they go back and start from where they left off. They never lose focus because they know we're only here for seven days. Hajj is five days. And what is more important, Hajj or a fair in China? Why I'm saying this is because we as human beings lose track of what we are there for when we go to Makkah al Mukarramah in a lot of cases. Sometimes we think, no, I'm here for the hotel room. So something goes wrong and you lose your cool with the agent. You lose your cool with the agent. So if that's what you were there for, mashallah, you'll enjoy your five star accommodation. Then what will happen? The rest of it, I don't know. Allah accept us all. We don't go there for accommodation. That's something we need to clarify in our minds. We don't go there for five-star meals. No, Allah will test us. We don't go there for the best of most luxurious of items. No, Allah will test us in that also. Yes, if you have paid for it, the agent must not rip you off. If they have ripped you off, you have the right. You have the right, the Islamic right to raise it with him and to get back your money or to make sure they rectify the problem in a totally dignified, Islamic, respectable manner, bearing in mind the sanctity of the earth that you are on, where Jibreel was there, and the Prophet ﷺ was there. Imagine, it could be possible that you are standing in your hotel room. It could be possible in Makkah al Mukarramah and in Medina al Munawwara. And this is to, to tickle our spirituality, I'm going to say this, that you are standing 20 floors up, not realizing that 1450 years ago, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam could have been standing on the same spot down there saying, don't get angry. And here we are 
so many years later standing on the spot and fighting about the fact that our toilet is too small. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. It could be possible. That is why don't ever lose your cool when you go for Hajj, no matter what. There is nothing on earth that justifies a person losing their cool in Hajj. Nothing. Not one thing. Even if your agent has left you on the street, that doesn't allow you to become angry. No, you will deal with it as a respected human being, bearing in mind that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam was driven out of Makkah. He didn't get angry. He went away. Allahu Akbar. He went away. We are his followers. Where are we? Where is he? That is why we go to Makkah so many times. We come back, we are the same cheaters and robbers and this and that. I have had cases of people who come to me and say, you know what, this man ripped me in business, but he goes for Umrah four times a year. And I say, look, it's got nothing to do with the Umrah and the coming back. He's probably going with the intention of holiday. Allah knows best. And sometimes you have to listen to two sides of the story because that man might also be lying to you. May Allah protect us all. So this is the problem we are facing. The point I'm trying to make is not that. It is the fact that we need to be conscious of where we went, where we are going, where we are standing. And what is the point of repeating visits and recurring if we haven't changed? It is an acceptance from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when you go to Makkah and Madinatul Munawwara. Makkah al Mukarrama, Madinatul Munawwara. Acceptance from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How? after being accepted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to visit the holy lands, do we allow ourselves to come back and forget the fact that we are from the chosen few because there are others. Wallahi, across the globe, take a look at Indonesia. They save up for 50 to 60 years only to go for one Hajj trip. And a lot of us, if you take a look at the statistics of the Hajj ministry, and I've seen them in the past, 60% at one stage of the Hajis from South Africa have made Hajj before. Allahu Akbar. If the quota is 2,500 and they push it up to 5,000, the other 2,500 a lot of the times will just be coming in because they've made Hajj before they want to make it again. MashaAllah. There's nothing wrong with that. But we don't realize the value of the Hajj anymore because we go for it so many times and we can afford it. Whereas there are others across the globe wallahi they save every penny they have these little small tins where they put their monies and devaluation comes and sometimes takes away a little bit of that money or a lot of it in the case of zimbabwe all of it the currency was demonetized you know what is the meaning of demonetized first time i heard the word there it means this money is no longer money finished that's what it means demonetized imagine if that had to happen to the rand i think we would be May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept us. We would be the biggest buzruks making dua day and night. That's a fact. That's why you get pious people in Zimbabwe, inshallah. They were forced to become pious. When a person has a problem, that's when you tear the musalla, mashallah. And when the person doesn't have a problem, what happens? They tend to forget Allah at times. Allah says that in the Quran. That, وَإِذَا أَنْعَمْنَا عَلَى الْإِنسَانِ أَعْرَضَ وَنَآ بِجَانِبِهِ وَإِذَا مَسَّهُ الشَّرُّ فَذُو دُعَاءٍ عَرِيضٍ Subhanallah. Allah says when man is given gifts and he is granted everything, then he tends to turn away from us. He forgets us. When we put a problem, he makes broad du'as. Do you know what the meaning of the term broad is? Wide, a wide du'a. A wide du'a is not a du'a where your hands are like this. You know, one that side, one this side. That's not a wide du'a. The sunnah is to cup your hands together and make it like you are begging, such that you can actually hold water in it. That's the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ in most cases. But the broad dua means the length of your dua is long. Whereas just before the problem, if the imam or anyone else had to make a dua that was a little bit longer, you would start scratching, itching. Hey, this man is taking too long in his dua. Now when you got a problem, one hour you're sitting, then there's nothing wrong. Wallahi, we need to realize and understand that it's time we revisited our whole existence. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us understanding. So we go for hajj. We would like to come back as pure as the day we were born. We will not get angry. That was the point I was on. We will not get angry and upset when we are there because shaitan is haris. Haris meaning he really wants to lead us astray. Just like Allah really wants to guide us and forgive us. Listen to what the Quran says. يُرِيدُ اللَّهُ أَن يَتُوبَ عَلَيْكُمْ 
ويريد الذين يتبعون الشهوات أن تميلوا ميلا عظيما Allah says Allah wants to forgive you Allah's intention is forgiveness He wants to forgive you He wants to open the doors for you but those who turn astray they turn astray completely they want to turn and shaitan is the one who intends and who wants to lead people astray and he's promised so we need to recognize shaitan now if we get to the actions of hajj the first thing that is of great significance is the dress the dress code in hajj is made up for the men of two pieces of cloth Two pieces of what color cloth? That's a question. You can't just wear green or brown. Two pieces of white cloth. In the absence of which? Slightly off-white. In the absence of white. Slightly off-white. Or the closest you can get to it. But Alhamdulillah with us, every single one of us we get white. Now, what does that depict from a spiritual angle? It should remind us and it must remind us of the day we are going to die immediately because in the same way we got an ihram in our cupboard we need to have a kafan in our cupboard believe me it's a fact if we don't we are foolish our our spirituality will be dwindling at some stage we need to keep a kafan wallahi in our cupboards and look at it every day look at it every day that is the kafan you need to keep you might not use it because you might die elsewhere but if you've got it, you become conscious of the fact that we've also got to go. So that is something that I'm encouraging everyone to do. You have, a lot of us have ihrams. Some of us have more than one ihram, mashallah. We know we're going to go inshallah to Makkah. Possibly we're planning this and that. What about our kafan? It's the same pieces of cloth, white cloth. Keep it as well and look at it every day. Keep it right there. You open. Wallahi, it will make you a better person. I promise you. If you, are, if you are a sincere man, it will make you a better person. A sincere woman, it will make you a much better person. You become conscious of your creator immediately. Because you know, when I go down there, the only help I can have is my creator. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives you a test run. What's the test run? By going for Umrah or going for Hajj. You're now putting on two pieces of cloth, no underwear allowed. Imagine. That's a rule. Some people don't even know that. May Allah protect us. But no underwear allowed in the case of males. The females, mashallah, they've been given a leeway. That's the respect that Islam accords the female. She's been given a leeway whether it comes to shoes and it comes to uh, her, her clothing and so on. Alhamdulillah, she can wear. But for men, our restriction is far greater. You wear an ihram. It should remind us of the day we are going to pass away. Not only that, when you enter the haram in Makkah to Mukarrama, what happens? You now see... Hundreds of thousands of people circumambulating the Kaaba, making the tawaf, going round in an anti-clockwise motion. You now join the rest of the creatures of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in an anti-clockwise motion. The galaxies, all the planets, everything, you are now moving, going round. But who are you? You are no longer that businessman. You are no longer Mr. So-and-so. You are no longer whoever you thought you were in your masjid. When you enter your masjid, everyone looks at you and greets you because you're there every day. You're no longer a, a big fish in a small pond. You are now a small fish in a huge pond. No one recognizes you. And if someone does, you're lucky. But don't talk to them whilst you are making tawaf. Allahu Akbar. You can make an ishara to acknowledge them. But preferably, don't even talk. You must concentrate with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But generally... You won't be recognized. You are now just a number. You are just a number. You look like the others and you are no longer worth what you were at home or what you might be immediately after that ihram comes out. When you wear your clothes, people can see this man is a rich man. He's wearing solid clothing. You know, when you are in ihram, one of the ideas is to make you equal to everybody else. Nobody can think I've got money. So now I'm allowed to use a perfume. Imagine perfume is not allowed in a haram if it was we would be smelling this man's got oud hey he's a rich man hey that man's got this scent oh he's a rich man oh this man here he smells like achar you know what's achar may allah protect us the pickles ah that's this man must be from wherever i don't know may allah protect us so to solve the problem allah says no perfume nothing gone 
Subhanallah. Now we are going around in one order. Everyone is moving. It should remind us of the day we're going to die and the day of Qiyamah when we become one number. We are just a number. When we pass away, we don't take our wealth with us. We don't take our health with us. We don't even take our good looks with us. We don't take anything with us besides our deeds, our a'mal, whatever we've done, the good deeds, the heart that we've had, whatever we've put forth, that is what we will take. And we are just a number equivalent everybody else. We circumambulate the Kaaba. And thereafter, there are many benefits of going around in tawaf. It's amazing. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has made mention of a lot of these. But let's move after having just mentioned one point to the next issue. After the tawaf, what happens is we read two rakats of salah. That is there. Then we pause for zamzam. That is what should be happening. We pause for a drink of zamzam. And that drink of zamzam is so significant. The hadith says, Zamzamu lima shuribala. Zamzam is for whatever it is drunk for. Again, I repeat, because these are sacred words. Zamzam is for whatever it is drunk for. That means Zamzam will serve the purpose of whatever intention was behind the drinking of it when it was being drunk. What that means is a lot of us think that Zamzam is for health problems. And only that. It is also for health problems, but it can sort out your economic problems also. If that is your intention whilst you are drinking it, Ya Allah, help me in my business. And you're drinking Zamzam, it's included in the hadith. Why do you want to exclude it? Ya Allah, give me happiness in my life. Subhanallah. Ya Allah, give me barakah. Ya Allah, grant me hidayah, guidance. It's not only for your good health. Good health is part of it, possibly a big part of it. But everything else is included. Zamzam is for whatever intention you've drunk it for. Ya Allah, grant maghfira to myself. Grant me this, that. Make it easy for me. Make this for me. That Help me go through this problem, that difficulty. Make it easy for me and so on. All this is included in it. I think it's a valid point for us to take home and to bear in mind even when we are drinking Zamzam in the homes. And Zamzam has another power besides drinking, even applying it. It is such a blessed water that when you put it on your forehead, it cleanses it as though you are now cleaning a window with window lean. Subhanallah. You take a window, you use water with it, it might not be as effective. But take a newspaper and window lean, see what happens to that window. That belongs to the window. We are now talking about ourselves, the glass. We want to be see-through people. We don't want to be hypocrites. When we say see-through, someone looks at us and they, what they see outside is what's supposed to be inside, genuine. Not they see a broad smile, your ears are about to tear because of the broadness of your smile. And be, as soon as we turn around, we backbiting the same individual. May Allah protect us. Then we need zamzam and true zamzam. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us all protection. After we pause for a moment, that pause also teaches us that when we are engaged in ibadah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allows us rest. Even salah. Imagine salah comes in units. Units meaning raka'at. Two raka'ats, three raka'ats, four raka'ats. Imagine if it was 40-50 one time. It would be a marathon. We spoke about comrades this morning. One of our friends happens to be running there in New York or wherever. Comrades, Allah make it easy for him. But when we are engaging in salah, Allah says no. To, to increase your concentration and as a point of mercy for you, we will create units of salah. And when you make salam, you sit, you relax, you're drinking water, you can rest for a while, then you start again. Like when we say taraweeh, the sunnah method of reading taraweeh is two rakats, you break, you have a bit of water, so on four rakats, you break a little bit longer, you read a bit of dhikr, maybe you will drink a bit of water. It is known as taraweeh, a point of rest. With us, slowly over the years, what has happened is we've made it into a a different type of our comrades. May Allah protect us. We are worried about how long it takes and how short it takes and how quick and how fast and how sharp, sharp. That's the word. Sharp, sharp it is. Mashallah. That defeats the purpose. We need to be relaxed in a relaxed mode even when we are engaging in tawaf. Don't be in a rush. A lot of people, I've heard them saying, nah, seven minutes I was over. Five minutes I was done. 
if five minutes you did without rushing it, that was a gift of Allah. Believe me, that is when there is hardly anyone, you just with yourself around the Kaaba and a few people, then you can clean it in five minutes. But it must not be our intention to tell people, I finished my Umrah in 45 minutes, I was gone. That means you rushed it. Take three hours, take four hours, take two hours. Don't worry, that is an ibadah. You are at the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Take longer for tawaf. Allah blesses you by increasing the people so you can read more dhikr and you can make more du'as. And you are trying to rush. You are rushing, you bumping into people, number one. And after that, you can't remember what you are reading, number two. After that, you don't remember how many rounds you've made, number three, and so on. What was, the, what was the essence of that ibadah when we don't even know what happened? So another point we all need to learn is when we are engaged in tawaf, take your time. That is the purpose of the visit. Like I made mention of the fair in China, when a person then goes to the stalls in that particular fair, he will make sure that he spends time where he is interested and he will not rush nor will he want the person who is dealing with him to rush because that's his field that's what he went all the way there for imagine we go all the way to makkah we spend money we made effort everybody greeted us mashallah we went all the way there and we rushing when it comes to tawaf when it comes to safa marwa we want to finish it sharp sharp as the word is used what's the point we're defeating everything and we tell people i'll meet you at steak express just now allahu akbar and what happens we quickly, hey, that man is waiting at Steak Express. So we're running, we're running even faster. May Allah protect us. This is what happens sometimes. And shaitan enjoys this. Shaitan really enjoys this. Because you know, the kuffar of Makkah were sitting and watching the Muslimin making tawaf. And the Prophet ﷺ said, these shayateen are watching us. What we need to do is we need to open the right arm. And we need to stick our chest out and walk brisk. Walking brisk is a sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. He says, Al-Mu'minul Qawiyyu khayrun wa ahabba ila Allahi min al-Mu'min al-Da'if. Wa fi kullin khayr. He says that a mu'min who is powerful is far more loved by Allah than one who is a weakling. You know, when we're walking, we don't have to walk as though we are about to drop, you know, with jelly feet and so on. Walk firm, walk upright, walk with your chest in, in a position that shows your posture is solid. May Allah protect us. And that will help your health also. It is the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. Instead of slouching when we walk, naturally you get a backache very early. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala cure all those with backaches. So, shaitan comes, he wants to see us. He wants to see us disengaging, forgetting what we are there for. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us to be focused. I was speaking about the zamzam and the fact that we've now had the zamzam. There are many benefits of zamzam. Let's get to the Safa Marwa. What does it depict? Safa Marwa is in the history or it is commemorating the history of Hajar alayhi salatu wasalam, the wife of Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam. What was she doing? What was she searching for? It's important we know this and we try and think why did Allah force us to repeat that action? Why did Allah force us to repeat that action? No Safa Marwa, no Umrah. No Safa Marwa, no Hajj. Yet it wasn't a Nabi who initially did it. It was a mother of a Nabi. Subhanallah. Subhanallah. Have we thought of it? This female she didn't have rosy. She didn't have sustenance. She had no food, no water. She had a baby. The baby was crying. What would we do as fathers? That's a question. If your baby is crying and yelling and screaming all night, I think nowadays from the norm that a lot of people follow, they probably scream and shout at the wife and go into the couch and go and sleep there. Say, you deal with the child. Allahu Akbar. Oh, I don't know if it's the other way around where the wife tells the husband, you deal with the child. Wallahu A'lam, the world is turning at the moment. May Allah grant us all protection. But both of those responses are wrong. Here was Hajar alayhi salatu wasalam. She had nil, nothing. We, mashallah, we got one phone call. The pediatrician is there. Mashallah, we got him with us here today as well. One phone call. And next thing we know, this is what you do. That's what you do. You try this. It doesn't work. Phone again. We irritate him once again. Allahu Akbar. But what happens is we've got the milk. We've got everything. We've got the water. We've got the facilities. We've got the tablets. We've got the, the should I say, the syrups, what have you. And still we lose hope. There was a mother, one of the most honored, who had one of the greatest tawakkul in Allah. The trust in Allah is the lesson. She had nil, nothing, the heat, no water, no nothing. The child is crying. 
she was running from the top of one hillock to the top of the other hillock, from Safa to Marwa, from Marwa back to Safa, going up, looking if there's anything, making dua, Ya Allah, grant us some form of rosy, some form of sustenance, Ya Allah. This earth is barren. This earth is like this. This earth is like that. Here is Ibrahim alayhi salam. He left and he said, Allah will look after you because he instructed me to go and he told me to leave you. So remember, he'll never let you down. Subhanallah. And he's gone. And here she is. She and a woman and she began rushing at a certain point. You noticed green lights. That is where she was running. She, because at the bottom, she was worried that if I take too long at the bottom, I might get up and a caravan might pass from a distance. If it's at a distance, I can at least go there and see. Until subhanallah, Allah did not send the caravan. Suddenly, when the child was crying, she heard the sound of water. Water, miraculously. This means when you have true tawakkul in Allah and you make the effort. Not that you sit back at home and say, no, you know, if rosy is written for me, it will come. Sustenance is written for me. You know, this ceiling will open. As I see, there's a few uh, pieces of tape here. They'll probably open and the gold coins will start flowing down here. That's foolish. That's thick. May Allah protect us. Allah says, fulfill your role. Then you say, Ya Allah, I lay my trust in you. Lock your gate. Then you say, Ya Allah, I lay my trust in you. Not that you leave your car doors open and windows and say, Ya Allah, my hundred thousand is sitting there. Then you look after it. Allah will say, well, it was written that you are going to be foolish. And it was written that it not only was the hundred thousand going to be taken, but the vehicle as well. May Allah protect us. So she made an effort. We need to make an effort for our rosy. She made an effort for sustenance. And she never lost hope in Allah. We're not allowed to lose hope in Allah when it comes to our sustenance as well. And Allah will grant it to us from where we never ever expected this on condition that we have taqwa. Taqwa is God consciousness. Listen to what the Quran says. Amazing. Allah says, those who lay their trust in Allah, those who are conscious of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah will definitely grant them an opening and ease from a place that they never ever expected. They least expected. You got a big problem and nothing is happening. You continue, persevere once, twice, three times, four times. How many rounds were there? Seven rounds. Seven times, Safa, Marwa, and it's a long distance. And she went up and down and suddenly she heard water. Allah says that even the messengers of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we sent them assistance after we tested them in order to elevate their status. It's amazing how Allah says, do you think you're going to enter Jannah when we haven't yet tested you in the same way we tested those before you? Even the prophets of Allah said, Ya Allah, when is your help going to come? Now we've had enough of this problem. Then the help of Allah came. Which means Allah tests us to the limit. The lesson we have to learn there is, let us realize and understand. We need to make an effort to earn sustenance. Use your mind. Use halal means Allah will provide for you. Don't use haram means, clandestine means to earn a dollar or a rand or some form of wealth. No, that will have no barakah in it. Make an effort, have true trust in Allah. Then whatever Allah gives you, believe me, it is the most beneficial. When the Zamzam well began to gush out, it was not fruit juice, it was water. And they were thankful. They didn't ask Allah for anything else. They were thankful. What happened after that? Let me tell you very quickly how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala caused a multitude of people to settle in that area. Water started gushing in the middle of nowhere. After a short time, birds came. You know, the birds are given uh, these ultrasonic senses by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They can sense water. They sense the water, they began to fly. The Arabs were very intelligent and I hope they still are. But what happened is, they seen birds, the caravans that were passing. And they said, if there's birds here, there has to be water. We need water, let's go. They followed where the birds were roughly flying and up to today, up to today, Wallahi, I guarantee you, when you go for Umrah or for Hajj, check near the Zamzam well, you will find birds flying. Up to today, there's birds flying. Subhanallah, you will notice it or you may not notice it. But if someone has told you and you are conscious of it, there's no ways you can miss it. Especially whilst you're in Salah, you will notice the birds. So they followed the birds, they came there. And they noticed, hey, there's somebody here. 
they lived there and so on. It is reported that Ismail alayhi salam later on got married into one of those families. After how many years? Subhanallah. And those are the people of Makkah today. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's acceptance. Obviously there's been a lot of uh, mixing of blood and so on. But you still do find a few genuine original people. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us the ability to respect the sanctity of Makkah al Mukarramah because it has been declared a haram. Haram meaning everything is safe in it. You can't kill a fly for no reason. You can't kill a spider for no reason. You cannot destroy a tree or a plantation in Makkah for no reason. Yes, if the fly is irritating you, you can Bismillah and you slaughter it. But that Bismillah won't make it halal. So please don't eat it. You can also uh, kill a mosquito if it is disturbing you and so on. But for no purpose, you are not allowed to do anything. You can't even deface a plant, not even a plant in Makkah. Take off something. It is all protected. It is a, a, a sanctity of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the effort of Safa and Marwa, we see the fruits that it bore. Allahu Akbar. You know, generally it is said that when wealth comes into a home, it lasts on average three generations, no matter how much it is. Some are more and some are less. We ask Allah to bless us even further, inshallah. But generally, when wealth comes into a family, it lasts on average three generations. After that, Allah has to turn tables. He says that in the Quran. He turns it. He turns it round so that people can learn lesson of life to say, look, we cannot remain there forever and ever. But with Ibrahim alayhi salatu was salam, it remained until today. Until today it is there because of the fact that he was solidly, solidly, an individual who believed in Allah and never compromised the worship of Allah for anything. Never. Not once. Then, if I can move quickly, after we have completed our Safa and Marwa, it's important that we, after we've shaved our heads, in the case of the males, a lot of people ask, should we shave or should we cut? Let me give you an answer. Shaving is three times better than cutting. That's a hadith of the Prophet ﷺ. But the ruling I would like to say, to let people think is whether you've shaved which is better or you've cut your hair whatever you do you should ask yourself have i allowed the love i have for my hair exceed the love i have for allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who do i love more my hair or my creator then you decide whether you want to shave or whether you want to cut that's according to me that will help you decide inshallah so once you've cut your hair, very importantly, most of us forget to thank Allah now. A lot of people say, hey, now ihram is over. Let's go. We have a bath, have a shower. And next thing we hear and we there, McDonald's and KFC and Steak Express and what have you. Where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala keep us focused inshallah. Before all that, we need to sit and make a dua to Allah. Some ulama suggest that you make two rakats of shukr. It's not compulsory. It might not even be a sunnah, but... It's suggested, but what is definitely there? Thank Allah, Ya Allah, you've given me an opportunity to make Umrah or to make Hajj or whatever it is. Ya Allah, me, out of all people, this blessed land, do you know I can guarantee you, guarantee that when you are making Tawaf, you are walking on the same Mubarak and blessed spots that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, the best of creation ever to exist, has walked upon. That is acceptance from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How can we be oblivious of it? How can we forget it? The man himself was there. We are sitting, we see the Kaaba, but sometimes we are on our cell phones during Tawah. I've seen it with my own eyes, on our cell phones. I was coming to attend this particular function this morning. I left my phones at home. By the time I go back, I might have a hundred emails. No problem. That can wait. We are here for a purpose. You must be focused. It's something. We become enslaved by our phone. The minute beep beep, we want to quickly see what happened. Leave it. Let you, when you have a moment, you will see it. Don't worry. No one's going to die, inshallah. And if death is written for them, they might die. Whether you see the message or not, may Allah protect us. So we cannot become enslaved by these things. We need to be focused. Yes, if you are waiting for something important, I'm not saying it's wrong to check your phone. But... Every moment of the day, every little while, we're seeing this little piece, so on. So much so that we go to the Kaaba in our ihram, we take it. Not a problem, you might need it later on to contact or communicate with the other parties and what have you. But 
it doesn't mean your phone rings. So now suddenly you pick it up. Hey, you know what? And I've seen this with my own eyes. I'm making tawaf. I've finished three and a half rounds. I got a little bit. You know what? Yeah, but you can talk to me. It's fine. Just quickly. Allahu Akbar. What's that? What is that? We lost focus. There's shaitan. Another thing I noticed is, very sadly, we all know it's disrespect to the masjid when a phone rings in the, in the masjid. It's more disrespect to have a Bollywood song in a masjid. A lot of people do have it. It is the worst disrespect in the house of Allah where the hadith says, Salatun fi masjidi hadha afdalu min alfi salatin fi ma siwahu illa al masjid al haram. A salah in Masjid al Nabawi is a minimum of a thousand times better than a salah read elsewhere, except Makkah al Mukarramah, where it is 100,000 times better. It is the most sacred piece of land ever to exist. And that will ever exist is the land of the Haram in Makkah al Mukarramah. That is set. We are there, and suddenly our phone rings with the tone of Madonna. May Allah protect us. That's why these tones, even in our own lives, we mustn't use them. Not at all. A tone of someone else, a tone of this person. People with beat, proper satanic music in the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And worse than that, people will answer their phones like nothing went wrong. It's just a ringtone. Even if it was an ordinary beep, it's disrespect to the masjid of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the house of Allah, ordinary beep, put it on dead silent. Put it on vibration if you want so you can hear it. Or use it in the masjid to make a call, not to receive one. May Allah protect us. You can use it. It's not haram to have your phone because you might need it. Sometimes people can get lost and so on. But depends how we use it. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us all protection. Now on the 8th, on the 8th of Dhul Hijjah, people wear the ihram again in Makkah al Mukarramah and proceed to Mina. What is to be done in Mina? We know the physical part of it. Let's talk of the spiritual part very quickly. In Mina, what happens is, it is the prelude to the Arafah, which is the main day of Hajj. So you sit and you're supposed to reflect over your condition. You're about to go into the most sacred of days of the year, the day of Arafah. You are about to go into the most sacred of days. You are now sitting in Mina. You make at least five salah there, sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, And you sit in your tent, not to sit and chat. A lot of people forget. Wallahi, I, believe me, I've made hajj several times. And I've seen people forget in Mina. They say, no, come, come, we'll sit, we'll talk, we'll just. And we're busy backbiting about others. We're busy talking. That's shaitan coming to divert us. You need to make dhikr. And more importantly, contemplate over your condition. You're about to be transformed. It's like you're having a bypass. It's like you're having stents put in your heart, spiritual stents. Imagine how much anxiety you suffer before going for a bypass. May Allah grant all those who have been through any form of heart trouble, shifa. And protect all of us. This is a spiritual bypass, believe me. We are supposed to be preparing like before an operation, they say 24 hours or 12 hours, depending on how big or small your op is, null by mouth, nothing. Don't have anything through your mouth. Allahu Akbar. That is how your, the effectiveness or that is the requirement of the medical fraternity. When it comes to the spiritual fraternity, Allah says and dictates and requires, go to Mina, sit, read your salah, dhikr, contemplate over your condition. Ya Allah, I committed this sin in my life. I made zina. I did, I drank alcohol. I cheated so and so. I did this. I did that. Think about everything you've done. Make sincere tawbah. Ya Allah, forgive me. I'm about to go into Arafah. Ya Allah, change my life. Grant me baraka. Grant me rahma. Grant me this. Grant me that. And be believe me, by the morning, you are a person who's already so humble, full of humility, ready to face Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then we start proceeding to Arafah. And if you are taking a walk, subhanallah, as you are walking, you can think of the day of Qiyamah. You are going to walk quite a distance. Arafah is not near. Believe me, it's not near. As you are walking and you start thinking what you've done in your life and you are a mere number walking, imagine the day of Qiyamah, the day that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala resurrects us. We will, we will be all worried about ourselves. Similarly, on the day of Arafah, Allah is giving us a chance to clean the slate once again. And in Arafah, the same thing happens. We realize we are just a mere number. A lot of us, 
who have made hajj in the heat we cannot tolerate the heat it is so hot we used to water ourselves down now it's a bit cooler because now hajj is basically in winter in the in the arabian peninsula's winter but we had a time when it was in the mid of the summer even in the not so mid of the summer but the heat we couldn't stand it though we are under a tent imagine what rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam and them went through we can't tolerate the 50 degree heat and we are committing sins that will drive us through to 5 million degrees of heat in the fire of jahannam may allah protect us so we need to think of it that allah is giving us a gift by making it a bit hot here so that we can think that hey if this is so hot and this is only 50 what about the the coldest fire in the fire of jahannam is more than 70 to 700 times hotter than the hottest flame of the dunya we can't afford to risk that so the way forward because we are human beings seek forgiveness ask allah ya allah forgive me ya allah grant me forgiveness the hadith says al umratu ila al umrati kafaratu lima baynahuma wal hajj al mabrur la jaza lahu illa al jannah the hadith says that the gap between two umrahs that are fulfilled the sins between two umrahs that are fulfilled are actually forgiven here we're talking of the minor sins and when it comes to a hajj there's no reward for it except jannah so long as it is acceptable they say hajj mabrur the acceptable hajj what is a hajj mabrur i want to repeat that short sentence it is that hajj wherein when you come back you have changed your life you feel the change in you that is known as hajj mabrur but if you come back into your routine once again everything is remaining the same that can never ever be a hajj mabrur never ever no matter what you say or what you try so allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us the blessing of the day of arafah we are now purifying ourselves concentration for one whole day or at least the bulk of that day and the peak of it the climax of it is late the late afternoon the time of what is known as wuquf when we will cry to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala think of the day of qiyamah think of the others make dua for everyone remove the pride remove the hatred the malice the jealousy make dua ya allah soften my heart make me a better person now once we are forgiven completely clean we will now go to muzdalifa and spend the night without tents if you notice in muzdalifa there's no tents you spend the night just there if you're lucky you might have a bit of cover otherwise you won't so as i was saying in muzdalifa we are ourselves with ihram what is above us the sky you will see the stars you are tired but allah is showing you that materialism means nothing it's like you are lying in a grave an open grave you need to think of these things you need to think of when you die what will happen now you are lying in muzdalifa sitting there's no matter so to speak if you have a little bit of your own it might be something positive but you are generally sleeping on the floor but the sleep you get there is powerful powerful sleep so beautiful that you won't even realize that you've slept for so long and you've slept so well in muzdalifa that is the power of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that is the gift he gives us because we've purified ourselves he is the owner of sleep we picked up the pebbles we are now sleeping we ask allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's mercy what do we do the following day let's think of it the most important part of hajj is arafa and what's after arafa arafa and immediately after it you have muzdalifa and now we are going to pelt the devil what is the spiritual significance there are many benefits of pelting it is part of the hajj but the spiritual angles we need to know is there a shaitan in mina the answer is no is there a shaitan that we are pelting the answer is no if there was we would have to use rocks and cannons really we would have to use tanks because with us the shaitan that comes in our lives even if you use a tank i don't think he'll disappear he still he's like a person who's or he is like a, you know tank proof so to speak blast him with a tank and next thing he's still standing in front of you may allah protect us all we ask allah's protection so what is the significance we say allahu akbar or bismillah allahu akbar we are taking the pebbles seven pebbles the size of a pea what can the pebble the size of a pea do physically nothing but spiritually it's more than a mountain listen to what it should do for me and for you we have bad qualities 
When we are in Mina, we need to think of our bad qualities. Didn't I say that? Yes. Now when we are going to Mina again, the same place we left from, we went to Arafah, we sought forgiveness. I have bad qualities. The first one is the hatred I got in my heart. I need to say Allahu Akbar, the shaitan in me, I'm taking him out with that pebble and I'm leaving him in that basin. So I say Allahu Akbar, what is gone? You're supposed to read the dua. Raghman li shaitan, wa li rahman. This is even though shaitan doesn't like what I'm doing, but Allah loves it. So I'm doing this. We are taking out the shaitan from inside and leaving him in Mina. Seven bad habits, the biggest and the worst of them, go the first day. If you do it properly. If you do it properly, your seven worst habits that you have, the worst that are letting you down completely, you need to promise Allah that I'm leaving this in Mina and I'm going. When I go home, I'm pure as the day I was born. So the first thing, hatred goes out. Bismillah, Allahu Akbar, it's out. And your hatred, you are now a hatred-free person. Whether it's against your brother, your in-laws, your family, your relatives, whatever, um, sometimes step-parents and what have you, all that is gone, you left it there. The next thing, after your hatred, your jealousy. The jealousy, I become very jealous, very quickly, of people who are doing well. And this, Allahu Akbar, it's gone. Where did you leave it? You left it in that basin. The next thing, another one goes, your deception. The next thing, the lies, lies that we utter. A lot of us are guilty of white lies. White lies does not make anything halal or haram. It remains a lie. And a lie is a lie in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Sometimes we lie just to make the discussion a little bit more lively. That is a very bad habit. A person becomes known as a liar in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when they do that. So that lies, the habit of lying, we throw it out. Bismillah, Allahu Akbar. And it's out. Where? In Mina. The seven, they call it the big shaitan, don't they? The seven biggest, the worst of your habits, the downfall left there. Then we go away. That day we spend in Mina again. Mina is a place of contemplation. We will think again what happened. This, we go, we get our, our animal sacrificed somewhere nearby. Then we, we will shave our heads thereafter. In the case of the females, cut whatever portion you are told to cut. But we think about the shaitan that we've actually left in Mina or the first seven. The next day we have another 21 to remove from us. The next day we have another 21 shaitans to take out. Some of the lesser habits, medium habits and big habits, which are bad, leave them all. The following day, another 21, subhanallah. And by this time you will have done tawaf al ziyara, subhanallah. You have gone to the Kaaba and you've circumambulated it again as a pure individual who has pledged Allah that not only am I thankful for you having forgiven me, but the bad habits really I am throwing them out. What's the point of aligning your vehicle when the balancing is out? You've aligned your, your wheels, but the balancing, the rim is bent, buckled. What's the point? You're going to go back and you're still going to feel that shaky feeling or the wobbly feeling of your tires and your steering wheel. That's what we do sometimes. We go for Hajj, mashallah, but we forget that we, if without taking the bad habits out, we're going to come back with the bad habits. We are buckled. It's a wheel that's buckled. We've aligned the car. We've done everything. But the tires themselves need reparation. So this is why we have made the promise in Arafah. We've got the forgiveness. Now we need to take out the bad habits, leave them there before we get home. And we do tawaf ziyara but that's not enough. We still got a tawaf wida which we're going to make at the end. Because we got to go back for another pelting session of 21 habits. So when we're sitting in Mina, have a book, write down your bad habits. 21, 21, and another seven. And if you want to stay one more day, no problem. Another 21, another 21, subhanallah. Count them and write them down. These are bad habits and categorize them. Sit, that's your life. Sit and categorize them. These are very bad habits. These are habits which are there, but I need to rectify them. This introspection, Allah gives us so many days to do it in Mina, to do it in Arafah, to do it in Mina even after that. But we are sitting and we don't even realize what the journey of Hajj is all about. We go there on holiday, basically. And we are sitting there, mashallah, we worried about our food, how luxury our room is, mashallah. And whether or not the agent has done everything he's supposed to have done. And we start shouting and swearing. We go for Hajj, we come back. Our seats are probably cancelled. And that was also a plan from Allah to test you. You know, the anger needs to also go with one of the 
with one of the stones. The anger I have in me, I must control it. This anger, I'm sending it here now. It's gone. No more anger. We need to be patient. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us protection. Then there is tawaf ul wida, which is the final tawaf. After you are pure, you have got rid of how many bad habits? You can count them. How many? So many bad habits. The 10th, the 11th, the 12th, we pelted 7, 21, 21. A minimum of 49 of your bad habits are left there. Imagine if we are to count our habits, I don't think a lot of us have the power enough to write down more than 49 bad habits. But we've definitely got more. And if we are to leave them there, now do you see where Allah says, This person comes back as pure as the day their mothers gave birth to them, and even better. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's understanding. I've said much. And I know I've discussed it from different angles, but for me, the core of Hajj is exactly what I mentioned today. To say, when we go, we are leaving our bad habits there. What is more significant than pelting a shaitan is to remove the devil from within and leave him there. Remove the devil within. So when we come back, we have a broad smile. We see the nur is on our faces, mashallah. We come, we are not angry, we treat our workers properly, our family members, we are conscious with them, we are obedient to our parents or respectful at least. We have mercy on our children and those who are younger, we respect the Muslims, we have no hatred for anyone, so on. Now we will, inshallah, enhance ourselves in every single way and enhance the Muslim Ummah. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's acceptance. I hope and I pray that whatever I have said has benefited firstly myself and then every one of us who has seated here today. Obviously, there's a lot to be said. But this is just in a nutshell for our benefit. May Allah take us all for Hajj, those who haven't been, as well as those who have been. Allah take us again. No harm in making dua in that way. And those who are going, may Allah make it easy. May Allah accept it from you, inshallah. And may Allah protect you from all the health problems that they have there. I don't think it's as serious as they make it out to be. But at the same time, may Allah grant you every form of ease. Our duas are with you. When you go there, please don't forget us all in your duas. We need the du'as. We make du'a for you, you make du'a for us. Inshallah, the du'as will be plugged in and Allah will accept them all. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have mercy on all of us. Wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala nabina Muhammad. Allahumma salli ala nabina Muhammad wa ala ali nabina Muhammad wa barik wa sallim. Allahumma a'inna ala dhikrika wa shukrika wa husni ibadatik. Allahumma ahfadna min kulli bala'i dunya wa azab al-akhirah. Allahumma la mani alima a'atayt wa la mu'atu ilima manat. Wa la radda lima qadayt wa la infa'u dhal jadd minka al-jadd. Ya Allah, forgive our sins. Ya Allah, we've committed so many sins. Ya Allah, we've lost track of the amount of sins we've committed. Ya Allah, forgive us. Ya Allah, we repeat this every single time. But Ya Allah, we are being sincere. We really need your forgiveness, Ya Allah. Without your forgiveness, Ya Allah, we have absolutely no hope. So forgive us, Ya Allah, through your mercy, your power, Ya Allah. Ya Allah, through your clemency, Ya Allah. We plead for it, Ya Allah, forgive us. Ya Allah, grant us the best of days, Ya Allah. Keep us healthy, keep us fit, Ya Allah. Spiritually, Ya Allah, elevate us. Make us regular with our salah. Help us to dress appropriately. Help us to read a portion of your Quran on a daily basis. Help us to try and understand the Quran and the sunnah of your messenger, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Help us accord the true respect to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Ya Allah. The true respect to Makkah al Mukarramah, Ya Allah. The true respect to Medina al Munawwara, Ya Allah. The true respect to the holy lands, Ya Allah. Keep us focused whenever you take us there and take us there regularly, Ya Allah. Those of us who have not made Hajj, Ya Allah, help us to go there, Ya Allah. Those of us who have made Hajj, accept that Hajj from us, Ya Allah. We ask you to take us back again and again, Ya Allah. Those of us who are going for Hajj this time, Ya Allah, make it easy for all of us and all the Hujjaj, Ya Allah. Let the Hajj be a very, very smooth Hajj, Ya Allah. Let us all return from Hajj, Ya Allah, as pure as the day we were born, Ya Allah. And let us live a life thereafter, conscious of the fact that we are Hujjaj, Ya Allah. We thank you for everything you've given us, Ya Allah. You've given us so much, Ya Allah. Bless us, bless our offspring, Ya Allah. Ya Allah, guide us and keep us guided. Make us from those who can distinguish between right and wrong and stick to what is right. Stay away from what is wrong, Ya Allah. Ya Allah, bless the women of this Ummah, Ya Allah. Help them and guide them in every way. The mothers of this Ummah, Ya Allah, make motherhood easy for them. Those who are married, Ya Allah, grant them happiness in their marriages. Those who are not, grant them spouses who will be the coolness of their eyes, Ya Allah. Those who have children, make those children obedient and good, Ya Allah. Pious, Ya Allah. Make them an asset to the Ummah, Ya Allah. And make them the coolness of their parents' eyes, Ya Allah. Those who do not have children, Ya Allah, grant them children through your power, through your mercy, Ya Allah. 
grant them children through your power, through your mercy, ya Allah. Grant them children through your power, through your mercy, ya Allah. And make those children also a means of the coolness of their eyes, ya Allah. Ya Allah, help us to accept taqdeer, however it is. Whatever it is, ya Allah. Help us to accept predestiny, ya Allah. Make us from those who can struggle and strive in the right direction, ya Allah. And grant us barakah and blessings in return, ya Allah. Ya Allah, bless all the ulama of this ummah, ya Allah. And protect them, ya Allah. Grant unity to the ulama, ya Allah. Ya Allah, grant unity to the general masses of the Muslim ummah, ya Allah. Ya Allah, safeguard the Muslim lands, ya Allah. Safeguard the Muslim properties, ya Allah. Safeguard us all in this country, ya Allah. And in all the neighboring countries as well, ya Allah. In this continent and on the globe, ya Allah. Safeguard us all. Ya Allah, grant us peace and stability, security in every way, ya Allah. Ya Allah, all those who are sick and ill, grant them shifa, ya Allah. Those who have cancer, ya Allah, cure them, ya Allah. Those who have arthritis, ya Allah, cure them, ya Allah. Those who have heart disease, ya Allah, cure them, ya Allah. Those who have sugar problems, ya Allah, cure them, ya Allah. Those who have any other ailment or sickness that we may or may not have mentioned, Ya Allah, grant them shifa through your power, your mercy, Ya Allah. Ya Allah, grant us sustenance and give us barakah in our sustenance, Ya Allah. Those who have debts, Ya Allah, grant them the ability to pay back, Ya Allah. Make easy for them, Ya Allah. Those who are owed money, Ya Allah, open their hearts to allow time to those who are being paid, Ya Allah. Make us not from amongst those who are crooks, Ya Allah. Make us not from amongst those who are deceitful, Ya Allah. Make us not from amongst those who are vulgar, Ya Allah. Make us not from amongst those who are liars, Ya Allah. Ya Allah, grant us the ability to dress appropriately, Ya Allah. To, to display our Islamic values and morals at all times, Ya Allah. Help us to promote this deen to both Muslims as well as non-Muslims, Ya Allah. Make us from the best of people, Ya Allah. Help us improve our character and conduct, Ya Allah. Help us improve our tongues, Ya Allah. Help us improve the condition of our hearts, Ya Allah. Grant us every goodness that Muhammad has asked you. And protect us from every single form of evil that he has sought protection from, Ya Allah. Until Musta'anu alayka al-balaghu wa la hawla wa la quwata illa billahi al-aliyi al-azim. Subhana rabbika rabbil izzati amma yasifun. Wa salamun ala al-mursaleen wa alhamdulillahi rabbil.